Good evening. I literally just finished grading the exams about a minute ago. So, well, okay, maybe three minutes ago, but 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 not very long ago. Oh, hang on a second. All right, all right. Um, <clears throat> some of my work programs are still open, so I'm closing those just to get them out of my way. Uh, I don't think I need that anymore either. Uh, no, I might. Okay, so uh, let me do a, a little bit of a quick analysis. Let's see if I can get some analysis out of this. Uh, no. That's all good. But I'm trying to... Hmm. Learning how to use D2L again. <clears throat> Delete assignment, hide from users. Yeah, I don't want to hide it from you guys. Um, huh. Hmm. Well, I thought I could get some nice demographics on it, but it doesn't look like it. Maybe if I go to a different place here. Ah, here we go. <clears throat> All right, um, the average score, oops. actually, I shouldn't use average because average isn't actually correct. We use average, could mean multiple different things. The mean was 68 points. That's about where I kind of expected it to be. Um, there are multiple scores. Almost, almost everyone did seventy-five or better, though. So there was a there was a handful of really fairly low scores. So if you're one of the people who has a fairly low score, um, you're going to want to try to figure out uh, a ways to improve that. And and a lot of it really just I mean. So one of the things with the exams is you can spend as long a time until you're satisfied that it's correct. So uh, you're going to have some misconceptions. That, that's fine, and I understand that. Uh, but a few misconceptions means probably put you in the 70 to 80 range, uh, n not in the in, in, in far lower than that. So anything lower than 50, I would be concerned if I was you. You need to probably pick up your game. Uh, <clears throat> If 50 to 70-ish, I, I would say is probably C range, maybe even low 60s, or uh, high 60s is probably C range. Um, and then uh, from there to about 80 to 82, somewhere's in there, 82, 83 is going to be B range. And anything above 80, 82, 83 depends on... Uh, because I do use the high score, and there was one person who did get a hundred, so uh, which is terribly rare, um, and you know there's uh, you know much credit to the person who did that. So um, okay, good. All right, so uh, that's the mean. Uh, do I do we want to look at anything else? Um, I just give you a, you know, kind of give you an idea uh, of where you stand on it. Uh, although, probably a better thing to look at is your total points. And I really wish I could do a total thing, a total points thing, uh, but I can't necessarily. <laughs> um, is there a running total? No, no, it just, I got to probably add a column in here that's a subtotal or something to try to figure this out. But 
Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll see if I can't get that done by next time. So, uh, I need a, a total in D2L. And I want to make that visible for you guys so that you can see it. Um, all right, so I'm still seeing the same. Okay. All right, well, whatever. Okay. <clears throat> YouTube was telling me that my stream is in excellent condition. That's great. Thanks for telling me. I don't need that. I'm just happy that it is. Okay. <clears throat> uh, but I think everyone, for the most part, people are, are on the right track or tracking well, um, w with, a, with a handful of exceptions. Uh, I think people are tracking really well. For those of you who are not, again, just pick up your game. If you need some help, if you feel, feel free to email me. Um, I can do Zoom meetings. I can do just email to try to help you out uh, or, or whatever it is. You know, so, so feel free to reach out. Um, I've, I've tried to be pretty responsive. There's been a couple times where I've kind of lagged a little bit, but most, most of the time I've been very good. So, uh, and I'll try to continue to be as, uh, as good as I can. So feel free to email me and, and let me know. And the, the best way to email me is through my Anoka Ramsey email address, which I think you can reach through the D2L site. So, uh, although, yeah, don't message me on D2L because sometimes I don't check that every day. If you, if you need it immediately. So the, the Anoka Ramsey uh, email is the best one. I do watch that all of the time. So... Okay, let me flip back here. Um, consult my copious non-notes. Um, so some of this is going to be very, uh, very ad hoc or extemporaneous. Ooh, I do have some notes though, so it's not completely extemporaneous. So this is, I should probably note, this is exam one. Oh, do I have... The median, which means half the people scored higher and half scored lower, was 77. <laughs> that's, I guess, that's all I'm really going to be able to give to you guys. Um, the standard deviation is pretty high, <laughs> so it's uh, standard deviation is 31.3. Means a lot of people were pretty far away, so that's that's reflected in the scores. Okay. Uh, do I need to talk maybe a little bit about a couple of the questions? Uh, yeah, let me throw up, um, throw, not throw up. I don't want to throw up. That would be bad. <laughs> uh, let me get up here and, and I, I'm just going to go down through them and I'll, I'll talk about them very, very briefly. Uh, what, what's the difference here? Um, is it exactly 1 billion bytes? No, it's more than 1 billion bytes for 1 gigabyte. The problem is, is depending on who you talk to, it's different. I, I come from a computer science perspective, where especially where I'm looking, where we're talking about the memory, and we're going to do some more talking about this later today, uh, today, when we're talking about how much is actually stored there, and in that case, we're always going to use a base 2. So in CS, we use a base 2. If you're actually buying a hard drive, you're probably using base 10. They're probably using base 10, because that makes them look a little better. And hey, that's what marketing does, right? They do that on everything, from what, whatever it is. So I always try to make their product look as best as possible. So and I don't necessarily blame them for that, but it is, I would say it's more accurate to use base two. 
because that's really what's going on. Depends on if you're talking to a computer science person or not. So, eh. <laughs> welcome to. Uh, as soon as you tell people that you uh, have a computer science major, everyone expects you to be able to fix their computer. So there you go. Uh, welcome to, welcome to the world of being a computer tech for the rest of your life, even though you didn't sign up for it. <clears throat> Fair enough. Um, so the second one on the two types of memory, I was looking for synchronous and asynchronous. There are a lot of people who, who talked about RAM and ROM, um, and I talked about that some last time, um, but, but we hadn't covered that yet, and it was in a chapter that wasn't part of the, the exam. So, so I, I, I lent myself more towards, um, to saying that you needed to have synchronous and asynchronous, because those are the two types of, or styles maybe, or types of memory. And I addressed it a little bit last last lecture, so you'll have to go back and look at that. Uh, the von Neumann execution cycle, well, yes, there's four steps, but there's really only three steps, but there's four, st so a lot of people had to improvise with either load or store. So it goes fetch, decode, and then, and then potentially load, because you might have to load an address, uh, not an address. You might have to use the address that's there to load some data into a register, and then, but that one's optional potentially. And then, uh, the next one is execute, and then the last one is store, because you need to store the value that you got from your execution. Uh, and so you either have to make load or store, which aren't technically steps, but they one of them has to step up because I required you to have four. So. And that's that. Uh, convert the, the binary number by hand. I think most people did a really good job on that, so I'm not going to cover too much there. Same thing here on uh, a two's complement. Um, uh, I, I can do that one really, really fast, actually, because I happen to know how to do 42 uh, into binary, right? So 42 into binary. It's my favorite number, so you know what? It's got to gotta be there. So... All right, so then I flip all of the bits, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add two in front here. I don't have to, but I'm going to, and the reason I'm going to is because that way, uh, that way it's eight bits. Not that it really matters that much, but okay. One, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. So that was my flip, and then I add one to it. So this is this is the ones complement. So then I'm going to add one to it, so I get a twos complement. So that's that. Carry a one. A little bigger. One one zero one zero one one. The other advantage is that because I put these leading zeros out here, when I flip them over, my first character is a one, which means that's negative. I'm going to call it and leave it at that, and that's my twos complement. That's my that's my answer. Just complement strip, pretty straightforward. Flip all the bits, add one, done. And you do it in that order. Okay. So I think there was a, a, a couple people, and I'm kind of wondering, you know, you guys probably should be careful about this because I, I hope it wasn't, I hope each one of you was doing it independently. N not because it hurts, hurts me, because I don't care, not really. Uh, but it hurts you because you don't necessarily understand the process if you're helping each other too much. So uh, some people said, oh, well, this is 42. And so then they actually just used 42 to solve this. And that just made it all kinds of problems. The other thing was is peasants multiplication, or in this case bit shifting, you needed to do in binary. So uh, for those of you who did it in decimal, I, I did penalize you for that. All right, uh, constructing the truth table, you need to make sure that you have the negation ones in there as well. I think that was the biggest tripping point for some people. Um, for this one, oh boy, this, one's a, this one was a little tricky, uh, but I think for the most part people got it right. So you would just flip, 
You can flip all of them at the same time, that's fine. That's not the way I solved it. What I did is I took the first part here and I made that into a thing and then I flipped. I made this into a, say, X or A and this into B and so then I, f I flipped this one, which is easy to do, right? You just double negative so I can just get rid of the negative. And then on the other side, I was able to put the negative there. And then I could do a De Morgan's Law again. It's not a big deal if you do all, do three at the same time because the, the same rules follow, but it's not strictly using De Morgan's Law. So uh, I didn't take any points off for it, but just be, just be careful about that. <coughs> and then eventually you get down, you can start absorbing it. A couple of people had some really, really cool... Uh, oh, wait, no, that was in the next one. Some really, really cool ways to solve this. And they, they noticed a, uh, a little trick here. And I, my guess is those people had had a bunch of experience in um, in doing Boolean algebra from other from other uh, academic pursuits. So uh, you didn't have to bring this all the way down. Uh, and you have to simplify. Uh, I didn't require you to simplify it completely, um, as long as you got it down into a fairly simple format. Um, I think. I think the answer was X, what was it, let me get my, XY plus X naught, Z naught plus Y naught plus Z, that's correct, that's what I got for this one. Um, this one I, I accepted two different answers, because that broke down into X, Y prime, or not, uh, plus Z, or X, Z. Or you could distribute the X's out, and then, then you're fine. So uh, this one, uh, almost everyone got that one good. So, and almost everyone got this one good, so I'm not too worried about those. And then I think everyone who completed this one got the full two points, so... Um, and, and a lot of that's just curiosity for me. And, and notice here, if you're going to do the math, please do the math. Make sure if there's a problem with my math, because sometimes I make mistakes. Um, and if I did, let me know, and I'll go back and review that. Uh, it is a little harder this time around because I didn't have paper to kind of take partial notes on and things like that. So... Um, Uh, oh yeah, so there's 102 points on the exam total, and that's because you got two extra points here, but the, the real score for the exam is only 100 points, so this is it's like extra credit, although I don't think extra credit is a good way to think about things, I just call it credit, it's just two more points of credit, so uh, because the score would have been capped at 100 had anyone achieved 102 points. Okay. That's that. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back here then, and let's go back to our memory problems. I know. <coughs> I forgot where I was. See, I have memory problems. Okay, that's not a dad joke. Okay, <clears throat> maybe it is. Ah, locality of reference. Locality, actually, let me... If you could actually be big enough to be useful, 36 works. Okay, good. Locality of reference. Oh, I can get all kinds of fancy with this. All right. T. 
temporal locality. Okay, so let me first off explain what locality of reference is. <coughs> Okay, so people have looked at how computers behave and how they access memory and locality of reference is how it accesses memory. And this is going to help us being able to figure out how to, to address and access our memory. And we're going we're gonna to come full circle on this, uh, hopefully tonight. <coughs> If not, I'll, I'll have to wait till Monday. So, the locality of reference says how uh, when I access memory, and when I say memory, I could mean cache or or uh, main memory. When I access memory, what are there some characteristics about how things get accessed. So the temporal locality says recent items tend to be accessed again. Here's an example. If you make a loop that has a counter in it, right, I use I, but you might use the word count, and every time through the loop it adds one to the counter. It's very common in um, any of the C-style languages, which would be Java, C++, C-sharp. <clears throat> Python, usually you don't use it as much, but you could. So, if, if you have that counter, it recognizes that you're going to likely continue to use that counter more often. Now, it doesn't know it's a counter, right? Because we're on the way lowest level, right? All it knows is a bunch of circuits. It's, it's a very, very dumb. Which, again, that's what computers are. Very, very dumb. They simulate intelligence by doing lots of things very fast. Which... Which is why AI, some of the AI stuff, is absolutely fascinating to me. Um, especially when it's not programmed and the thing actually learns itself. Really cool. <laughs> really cool. Uh, yeah, I don't think we'll have an opportunity in this class to do anything with that. But there's, um, there's a game of pickup sticks that I can actually create an AI and I can do it by hand. <clears throat> Pick up sticks is the wrong word, but it's it, it, it's the, I, this idea, uh, and and it, I can demonstrate in about a half an hour by doing it by hand how um, how it figures out how to how to beat you, and eventually it will get so good that you can't beat it. In like just a few games, actually gets really good at it. <clears throat> Anyways, it's super cool. Um, I used to do it with non-CS people, and they actually understood it too. So that 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 tells you that it doesn't require that you have a lot of programming to be able to understand machine intelligence. Okay. All right. So temporal locality means uh, recent items. Tend to be accessed again. Let me stretch this out so it's not. Oops. Spatial locality. Um, memory locations. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I'm using items to talk about memory locations. So, items tend to be 
accessed in clusters. So a way to think about this is an array or a list. We're going to put them all those things close together or a dictionary. You can have a data structure. It's all going to be placed really close together, probably. Uh, and But even if we don't do that, if we went and looked at that MIPS uh, simulator that we had, all the variables were sitting on the bottom, weren't they? So those tended to be together. So that's, that's an example of spatial locality. So we know that when data gets accessed, that it will likely, that there's a good high likelihood that other data close to it or itself will get accessed again soon. And the last one is sequential locality. And that is uh, instructions tend to be sequential. So we know this isn't completely true, right? Because we can have jumps in, um, right? We know in, in our assembly, we can have a jump. So if there's a jump, okay, well, that's fine. Then we're not going to, you know, we can either jump one space or we can jump around. But most of the time, we're just going to go to the next thing. We're just going to go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. Now, all of these are going to help us inform us why we're going to do some things. And we'll talk about how that works here in a minute. So, I don't know if I talked about this too much. The book does a great deal. Of, it spends almost two pages trying to get you to understand why we use cache. Cache is faster. <coughs> And way smaller. So one of the a couple of the examples I thought were kind of neat. Uh, if you go to the library to get some books that you're going to use for a paper, you don't check out one book, take it home and write the paper. Well, maybe you do, but that maybe that book doesn't have all the information you need in it. So you would check out multiple different books that you can reference. You're not going to reference just one, then bring it back, get a new one, do it that way, right? You're going to want to try to get all of them that you're going to need so that you can do it all at the same time. And that's similar to how cash works and what we're going to do with cash and how it works. I thought that one was okay. It wasn't a great example. A better one is the grocery store. Right? You're not going to the grocery... Usually, you don't go to the grocery store and buy enough food for this next meal. Maybe you do. Lots of people don't. <clears throat> you're going to go and you're going to buy food for a week or for two weeks or for a month, whatever it is, maybe for two days. Don't know. But what you're doing is you're bringing it home and you're putting it into your cupboard. When it's in your cupboard, now when it's time to figure in your in your refrigerator, when it's time to figure out what you want to have for supper, right? You open up the freezer, you look for uh, pizza rolls, you don't see any, and you say we're out of food. Right? Okay, that's not probably what happens, but uh, right, you can look for things and see if you can find them at your house. If you don't have them at your house. Well, then either they go on a list to be fetched from the store or you're going to immediately go to the store to get it if you really want to have that food for the next meal. Right, it'd be like running out of bacon, right? That's just, you can't run out of bacon. It's not possible. <clears throat> Or it's a tragedy. Let me pause for a second. 
talking about buying things. Most of you are, well, most of you are probably on this space because my guess is most of you are sophomores. But you can relate to this. When you graduate from high school and have to live on, in, and go and live on your own, which most of you are doing now, my guess is, I don't know. There's a skill that you have to learn. And I say this half tongue in cheek, but I think it's accurate. I think it captures very well the, uh, the skill that you have to learn. Because you never even knew that you had to learn this until you realized you had to learn it. And that is, you have to learn how to buy your own toilet paper. Because if you run out of toilet paper, that's about the worst thing that could happen. Right? You could be out of food. Yeah, we could deal with that, right? But being out of toilet paper, finding that out at the wrong time, not exactly very fun. So I think that's, uh, that's a, a great example of skills that you have to learn to be an adult. And so for me, when I talk about learning how to be an adult and live on your own, I talk about having to buy your own toilet paper. And it wraps up all of that in one uh, abstraction. <clears throat> I'm the only one who does it. I don't know why, because it is really an important thing. So, and it isn't something you thought you had to learn how to do until you learned how you had to do it. It's actually pretty funny. I don't know if I've ever run out, but I've certainly feared running out. So that's that's probably just as just as bad. All right. <clears throat> so make sure you always get enough. <laughs> uh. But don't don't hoard it, right? We don't want, want that either. So, uh, okay. There's three different levels of cash, and <clears throat> I talked about it a little bit last time, right? Between the difference between L1 and L2, and then. We've got L3, and but you know we didn't talk about that last time. But L3 does exist. It's very similar to L2. It turns out that what we're going to talk about and how we're going to do things, it doesn't matter if we're talking about L1, L2, or L3. It's not. It's pointless. It doesn't make a difference. <clears throat> we can just think of them all as the same thing. Eventually, we want everything in L1. We're going to want to move things into L1 to use them. Sometimes we're going to go out to L2 to fetch it, to bring it in to L1. Sometimes we're going to go out to main memory to get it. One of the things that happens is when I copy over something in L1, if the other data has come from L2, a lot, some systems will actually just swap the data. They'll swap the data in that, those two positions. So the, uh, the other thing didn't go out of memory, it just went got downgraded one level. So think that realize that that's a possibility as well. The other thing I could do is I could just forget it, right? Because it's stored out in, in the, the storage somewheres. So I don't care. I don't need to hang on to it anymore. I could just throw it away. Another thing that I could do is I could go out to main memory or to main storage, make sure that it's uh, saved in the updated version. Like if it's changed, then I'll go out and, ch and check on the hard drive to see if I need to change it there. If I do, then I will do that at that time when I when it goes out of memory. Sometimes we update continuously, like if something changes, then it'll change on the hard drive as well. It just depends on the schemes. I'm not gonna talk about those too much. Operating systems really is the place where you'll deal with some of those minutia. But we are gonna talk about <clears throat> how to, what, what happens when we miss. Well, first off, actually, we're gonna talk about how to know how, where to put things into cache. And we're going to deal with really small sizes. And I'm just going to say cache, and, and then I'm going to... So I'm going to differentiate two levels. One is 
our cache, and the other one is our memory. And so that's probably RAM, but it might not be. <clears throat> it might, might even be the hard drive. But we'll abstract it because in the higher realm of things, it really doesn't make a difference where we're going to fetch that thing from. It's just how do we get it into L1? Think about it that way. And I'm just going to say, you know, maybe we're going to bring it into L2. It doesn't matter. It's the same exact process. So there's a target place we'll call cache and another place we'll call memory. Okay. Now, remember, when data is saved, it could be, there's, there's two different ways to address data, right? It could be byte addressed, which is what we're going to talk about today, or it could be word addressed. If it's word addressed, let's say you're using a 64-bit machine, that means it will be addressed, it will, it will show you the address in a group of eight, right? There are eight bytes per word, and so, because a byte is defined as eight characters. So, when you, if you address it with the, with the, with the word addressing, then it, things will look a little different, uh, and actually adds another layer to it, but we're not going to worry ourselves with that, okay? So, we're just going to do as if it's always uh, byte addressed. Okay, so let's, let's go back here, draw a nice line here, okay, so let's do the first one, I'm going to do direct, map. Okay. We have to have a way, because remember, cache is small. Memory is big. So this is cache and this is memory. How do we decide where things go? Right? I could say, right, the first, say there's, right, there's four here. Say, say there's, say there's 16 here. Sorry. Yeah, 16 bytes. And this is four bytes. Zero, one, two, three. Ah, and we're going to get an example of why we start counting from zero. You guys will see it here in a second. Right, so this is zero, one, two, three, dot, 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 down to, what's the last one? 15. Okay. So what we could do is we could say, well, geez, you know, 4 goes into 16 four times. We could just take the four, the first four registers go into the first slot. The next four registers go into the second. Could could always map to the, the first slot and or the second slot or the third slot. But that violates something. So remember, <clears throat> we've got temporal locality. Recent, okay, means we don't want to cover up things that we've recently accessed. Spatial locality, which says usually things come in clusters. And sometimes those clusters are sequential. Okay, that means if I need to access number one, there's a good chance that zero and two will be accessed soon. So we, we don't, if we bring in one, 
And then the very next thing we have to access is two. <clears throat> we don't want to cover up one because there's a good chance that we're going to come back to one. We're going to access it again. So we want to be careful about that. And we don't want to do that. So that's not what we do. We don't take these four and move them into there. What we do is we take whatever spot they're in here, okay, and we do modulus on it by the number here. So we go 16, 16, not 16. We say address in memory, percent sign, which means modulus, and then that modulus is by whatever number is here. So let's say that, so this is by four. So then if I looked at, say, number, I'll do a slice in here, number 12, 12 modulus, 4. It's like saying, right, modulus is like saying division. Get a remainder. I'm only interested in the remainder. It's the only thing I'm worried about. So, so 12 modulus 4, 12 divided by 4 is 3 remainder 0. So 12 will map to 0. But what happens if there's something else in there, right? If, one, if 0 is in there. So 0 is in there already. But then 12 has to go. Okay, so let's go back up and look here. Is it really violating any of our problems here? Recently, okay, it's going to violate recent, right? If zero was recently uh, accessed, okay, potentially. But we can't know on that one, and so in some ways we just kind of have to guess on that. So this one is the, the temporal one is, is one that we're going to probably violate the most. But maybe not. Spatial locality, well, these aren't that close together. Maybe in the grand scheme of things when we're looking at megabytes, they're very close together. But in this case, right, there's only 16 bytes, so they are not close together. In fact, in this case, we're going to say they're, eh, they're reasonably far apart. So we're not violating that second one, and we're certainly not violating sequential. So that's, that's how we decide which spot these go into. Now, hmm. We have a problem, a little bit of a problem. We need to figure out if, okay, so when I go looking for something, so say it says it's in position 12. Okay, in main memory, it's in position 12. So then what I do is I do the modulus, the computer will do the modulus on it by four and we'll get zero. And so it'll look in position zero. If it doesn't find it there, there's nowhere else it could be. So it always knows exactly where it's supposed to go. And every single slot, every single byte in the main memory has a place in cache where it will go when it goes to cache under this system. That makes sense? Hopefully. Okay, so, so it makes searching for things easy. Or I don't ever have to search for things. Now, however, if there's something in position zero, and I'm looking for 12, how do I know that 12 is there? Well, that's a tricky thing, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to save the whole address not the whole address. We're going to save all of the information in here, and we're going to save it in there. Oh, sorry. No, no. 
yeah, yeah. So, because each of these isn't a single byte. We're going to call it a block. And these are variable, and so I could change it however I want. The computer system will, will change them. So we could say one block. This is only in our example. Equals, say, four bytes. Now let's say eight bytes. Because that's a full word, isn't it? Eight bytes. That's 60, 64 bits. Right? Okay. And I'm running on a 64-bit machine, so it makes sense to say it's eight. It might not be. Don't care, doesn't matter. Okay. Because there's eight bytes in one block, internally, I need to know where the information is. So when I'm, let me back up a second. Inside of that block. And this is called the offset. So... Let me blow this up a little bit here. Right? We have half, 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 half. And this is sloppy. Uh, I, I should give you guys a little bit of a... Uh, something that I think maybe would help you. Maybe, potentially. I'm being sloppy. That's because I'm using a mouse to draw with. And I'm not good at that. If I was doing this on a board or on paper, I would not be sloppy. I would be neat. Because you want to lower the... Th this, And this goes for not only my class, but all, all others. I try to be as understanding as I can. <clears throat> We're computer scientists, not artists. It's okay. But one of the things you want to do is you want to lower the bar that it takes for an instructor to try to understand your work. So if it's clear and concise and not messy at all. So maybe even typing it up if that's what it takes. And some people did that. They, they typed up some parts of it and they left it as drawings for other parts. They inserted pictures in as needed. And that's great. I, I no problem. Using your technology. So... <clears throat> Let's say this is a... So So what I'm saying is, if I was going to draw this and I was doing it, say, on an exam or an assignment, I would use a ruler. Um, I probably didn't as a student, but now that I know what it's like on the other side, and let me tell you why. Because as a somebody who's grading, now, you try not to let this affect you. All professors are going to run into this, and almost none of them are going to tell you this. But what is going to happen is the professor is going to get annoyed when it's hard to read. We try not to let that affect us. And we probably don't. It probably doesn't affect us most of the time. But if I'm a student and I want to get a high mark, I never want to annoy the professor, ever for any reason. And so, in some ways, that's a way to think about it. Especially if it's annoying them about something that I can correct. And so, so take that with a grain of salt, and, and that's just, it's not even a suggestion necessarily. It's just a thing to think about. And some of you are great at it already, so you don't have to worry about what you're doing. So, uh, uh, others of you... There were times when I was like, what? I can't even read it. So the lines become very sloppy and it's hard to read. And again, part of the reason I'm doing it sloppily here is because I'm using a mouse, not a pen. If I was using a pen, things would look a lot neater. Or even a piece of chalk on the board. So try to get them as neat as possible. I know that's a little bit of do as I say, not as I do. So there's some, his some hypocrisy there. So, fair enough. It is It is what it is. So, and I try not to let it affect me. 
it's still it's still a thing. And I didn't realize it until I started grading. Uh, but eventually I kind of learned to understand it. So just putting that out there for you guys. There's all these little nuggets of wisdom I'm going to stick into stuff. Because I, I think a lot of professors are so concentrated on the thing. So like this. That they can't like think about things in a different way. Yeah, that's too bad. Okay. All right. So here's the thing. So we're going to call these. We're going to name these 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, down to 7. Okay. So... <clears throat> inside of the block. So first off, I'm going to tell the computer, go to the block. And so when it loads memory, it loads a block at a time. Well, that helps us with our spatial locality, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It also means <clears throat> that because of the way we're doing things, right, with the modulus instead of uh, some kind of a division schematic, that, right, so that the next one here is, is the four, Right, that's going to go in there. So because the, there's four blocks here, we're going to go at least four away for each of them. <clears throat> and what this does for us, right, is it helps keep spatial locality intact. It also keeps sequential locality intact as much as possible, right? We're trying to avoid uh, putting things that are close together in the same spot so they don't overwrite each other. Okay, so once we figure out which block we're going to go to, <clears throat> then this is, this is uh, we need to figure out a number from 0 to 7. So, the question is, how many byte, bits does it take to represent 0 to 7? Well, three. So my offset, and that's what the offset, that's the offset is called. Okay, the offset is um, like how many, how many bytes to skip to find my data. I'm playing fast and loose with some of the words, but that's, I think you guys get the idea, right? So it's, if it's zero, that's, we don't have to skip any, we're in the zero spot. If it's seven, we have to skip the first seven and look at the eighth spot. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Ah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down a memory location. Uh, um, ah, okay. Yeah, I'm going to break down a memory location. Okay, so there are 16 blocks. Each block has, has 8 bytes. So 16 times 8. 16 times 8 is 128. Okay. So I have 128 bytes. How many bits do I need to, to do that? Eight, right? Two to the eighth, okay. So the first three bits are my offset. How big does the block section need to be? Mm. 
because when I locate one of these, I need to know which block it's in. Okay. So 12 is in block 0. The highest I would get to is 3. And 3 in binary is 1, 1. So I only need 2 bits for that. This isn't right. I gave you the wrong number there. That's my mistake. It's a seven, isn't it? Okay, wait. Two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one twenty-eight. Yeah, it's seven. There you go. Learn how to count to ten on one hand. It's actually useful. It doubles the number of that you can count on two hands. <laughs> Unless you use one as a one's digit and one as a ten, then you can go to a hundred. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, I'm not going to take any more time. I've digressed enough. Okay. So then here, this is called the tag. And this will also be two bits. I'm going to show you how this works. It's actually pretty, pretty cool. Okay, so if we're, let's let's continue with our twelve. So what's twelve in base two? Eight and four and zero twos and zero ones, right? And let's say we're going to look at the fifth spot here. So then the fifth spot would be this. So that says go to twelve, go to the fifth spot. Okay. What block is it in? Well, I can look right here. Block zero. It does the math for me automatically by just doing it in this order. Now, what's this tag about? I haven't talked about that yet. Okay. So let me talk about what that tag is. There are four addresses that go to this first, the, the zero spot. Zero. Put them down here. Zero, four, eight, and twelve. Okay, so let me do the bits in, in, in zero. So zero is this. I'm going to use four bits for it. Four is this. Eight. Anybody seeing a pattern? Twelve. What's the pattern here, right? Our blocks are all right here, okay? So they're all zero, which is perfect. It's exactly what I wanted. But do we see a pattern here? Yes, I do. Because the first one is a tag of zero, then a tag of one, and then a tag of two, and then a tag of three. When I look at them in, in that way, right, where I just look at those first two bits. What this means is, if I'm looking for 12, if I'm looking for block 12, there's an extra memory location in here in each block that tells it what's saved there. And it doesn't have the offset there. Offset doesn't exist. It's just going to have the tag and the block. Actually, it doesn't even need the block. It just needs the tag. So each block contains just enough bits to tell it what the tag is. So I can go to, to block zero and say, what tag is here? Does it match the tag I'm looking for? Right, my 12, one, one. Yes, then that's what's there. No, it's not the correct thing. And I need to take and move the thing out of he, out, out of cache. And then, right, I would either write it out to memory or figure out, right, whatever method I'm going to use. 
and then I'm going to bring in whatever's in 12 and stick it in here. And then I'm going to change the tag, right? Because remember this, this word here is not this word. This is just the address for it. Hopefully that makes some sense. I'm going to go through a few examples. I don't have any examples figured out. Okay. I'm not going to draw pictures anymore this time. So my cache let's say this one has eight blocks. My main memory Has 64 blocks. And each block has four bytes. Okay. Let's figure out how long this has to be. Okay, how many bytes do I need for uh, for the number of blocks for here? How many bytes? Do, oh no, actually I don't want that. What I want is, I want to start here, memory. How many total bytes do I have? Well, this is 2 to the 6th, right? And this is 2 to the 2nd. I need to add those two things together. That gives me 8 bytes. I know it will be 8 bytes. Okay. Put the label on the outside here. Offset. So since each block is 4 bytes, I only need 2 bytes to do that. Right, so two bytes, two, sorry, two bits. There are eight blocks. That's two to the right, two, four, eight, three. So this will be three bits. So how much is our tag going to be? Well, there's two different ways to, count, to, to look at this. We figured out that there were eight bytes here. Sorry, that's not it. That's not right. Should be eight bits. So we could say, well, we've used five out of eight, so we have three left. The other way we could do it is, how many times does eight go into 64? Eight, eight is two to the third, three. Or we could just look at these two numbers and do a subtraction, because we already did that. So uh, this one will be three bits. All right, so if I have my, my favorite number, 42, which block does it go in? Hmm, okay. Let's split this guy up. Put a comma there, because it's two bits, right, for the offset. And put a comma here. So tag is 001 block 
is 0, 1, 0. And offset is 1, 0. OK. This means our tag is 1. Our block is 2. Or that means it's the third one. <clears throat> and our offset is 2, or also the third one. All right, so there's some disadvantages to this style. I'll, I'll do another, I think I'll do another example. Uh, let me see. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. What are the disadvantages to this? Well, I might access something in block zero, and then something in block four, and then something in block 8, and then something in block 12. Which means I will have had to fetch each time, bring it into, into cache, and then throw away the other thing. Sometimes. Uh, let's we'll talk about... I don't think the... Yeah, it, it does somewhere, but I don't know where. Um, it talks about something... So, okay. All right. So let's say I'm going to get something in block zero, and I'm going to get something in block four, and I'm going to come back and get something in block zero, and then something in block four, and then something in block zero. Wouldn't it have been nice if I just would have put those in the first two slots instead of having to keep switching them? Because remember, every time I switch them, it takes time. And that we talked about how long that is between memory, memory, and cache. But when we have to do a read and a write, it takes potentially takes even longer than that. Now, not significant, usually, but it is a little longer. So we want to avoid it as much as possible. Okay, the situation where one will go into cache, and then it'll get removed so that four can come in, and then four will get removed because one can come back in, and it kind of switches back and forth between the two. It's called thrashing. Or data gets deleted from cache and reloaded. Repeat. Hmm. Okay. Let's bring in our next idea. Because that's not good. Direct mapping is prone to thrashing. Now, we should try to minimize it as much as possible, but it is in there. Okay. This brings us to our next type of way, ah, fully associative. Let 
going to do here is I'm just going to type this out because it's, e it's easier to read then. So, the idea here, what's the idea behind fully associated cache is that uh, a block does not have an assigned 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 location in cache let me say it like this assigned static location right I talked about static last time we should be able to use that here right so that means it's unchanging so it's always the same no matter what. Okay, block does not have an assigned static location. Meaning, in before, when we looked at it, zero always went in the zero spot. Now we're going to say that's, that is off. We're going to strike that rule. Throw it away. All right. Well, now we have a problem, right? So we don't know where to put things. Hmm. Okay. And we don't know where to look for things. Right before, we said, well, if we want to look for 8, we know we can just look in the 0 spot. If we want to look for 10, right, it's going to be in the, set, in the 2 spot. We know that's where the only place it can be, so we only have one place to look for it. Now, if there are 8 blocks in my cache, I have to look in all 8 spots for my memory now. So I just multiplied by 8 how long it takes to check to see if something is in, if I have 8 blocks, right? Multiplied by 8, how long it takes. That's not acceptable. So to get around that, what we do is we check all of them simultaneously. So, okay. So now this time we don't have a block assignment anymore. We just have a tag. So if we go with this, the same thing, we, the same scenario we have here, we would simply have two bits of offset and six bits of tag. We just combine the tag and the block together because there isn't a block assignment anymore. And then there's going to be one bit just kind of sitting there all by its lonesome that's keeping track of if the data that's in here is still needed. Or no, sorry, not still needed, sorry. If it's, if it's valid, okay? If it's actually assigned currently. All right, so, and the book does a good job of talking about this. In order to check all of them at the same time, we have to have eight times circuitry. So we have to have circuitry for eight things to, eight, to compare if eight of them are the same, if the tag matches. Well, that's a lot, especially since eight really isn't realistic. It's way higher than that. So it's not very efficient. Also generates a fair amount of heat. Okay, all these things problematic. Okay, that's a, one of our problems. We solve it, but we still have to deal with it. Okay, now, before, we always knew, okay, what happens when it gets full? That becomes a problem. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pick a victim. I know these words are always fun. We're going to pick a victim. We say, hey, two, it's your turn. And we'll talk about later, we'll talk about how to pick your victims. Because there are ways to do it that it makes some sense, makes it a little easier to kind of understand. Um, to try to increase, try to, de to increase our hit rate. Okay.
an address has a tag and an offset. So if I go, yeah, like I said, if I go back to this, so let's, let's do an example. So let's say cache is four bits or four, four blocks, sorry. In memory, uh, let's stay at 64 blocks. That's fine. That works for me. And our offset. Oh, our block. Let's say our block size is two bytes. Okay, so two, that's two to the first. 64, that's two to the seventh. And this is two to the second. Okay, so how long does my address need to be? that plus that, right? Same here, that plus that. Eight bits. So the cool thing is I don't have to draw it exactly proportionally. My offset, <coughs> one bit. Is this gonna be a zero or a one? Either you skip one or don't. My tag. Do I care how big the cache is? When I'm figuring this out? No. Not at all. This is seven bits. Okay. Okay, so let me to give you a sense of what, what we're going to do here. Remember now each of these locations. Let me let me just let me just draw a new cache here. We got a four block cache. Okay. And then here we have a 64 block I'm just going to say 64 blocks. Okay. There's a bit on each of these, just a single bit, that's as either a zero or a one that didn't that tells the computer whether or not this current address is in use. So if I want to, if I want to bring in, let's say, well, let's let's go back to our our scenario, right? Zero, one, two, where we before we were thrashing between one and four, or zero and four. Sorry, zero comes in, boom, goes in here. Okay, call that X, and in four is some value for Y. So we just bring that in, we'll stick it in the first open slot. And then right, we might bring in Z and then W. And then if we have to bring in, say what's the next one? Uh it would be V. So, if 
I have to bring in V, I have to pick one of these to become the victim. I'm going to get rid of it. Let's just say I pick, pick this one. Doesn't matter. Oh, right. Okay. So I just picked one. Like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how to choose your victim later. Oh, geez, I just realized we're just about over time. Okay, so hang on a second. Let's 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 think about the situation where X and Y were, were thrashing between those two blocks. Well, now we don't have to worry about the thrashing. We're not, we're, we're not prone to it. But the problem is, the problem is, is searching to see if something's in our blocks. Because each bit has a circuitry so that it can split that compare and compare all four of them at the same time, or eight, or 16, or 32, however many it is. And it's, all, it's always going to be base two, because we need to break everything down. Like if this, ah, let's say, let's say this was 60. How many bits do we need for the tag? Still seven. Because to do six, we could only do 32 bits, or 32 blocks. Since we have more than 32 blocks, but less than 64, or 64 or less, that means it's going to be 7 bits. So that there's going to be some, blo some blocks that just don't exist. In this case, 4 of them. They just don't exist. Those numbers are invalid. So computer designers tend to not do that, because it's wasting data. It's, it's, we don't like doing that. <laughs> So, uh, they call, yeah, fully associative cache. Okay, so let me preview for you uh, the things we're going to talk about next time then. So, there's one that's halfway between these. It's called set, I think, set associative. Yep, yeah, set associative. And that one's probably the coolest of the bunch. And then I'm going to do replacement policies. And talk about pros and cons. Well, I'm going to cover three of them. And uh, EAT, which is X estimated access time EAT or sorry not estimated effective and and then maybe a couple other small topics and then some virtual memory stuff so this is what we're going to cover next time if you want to review ahead of time you know feel free to do that all right that's everything that I've got for tonight Hopefully you all have a, a, a great night. I think I have uh, some television viewing to catch up on because I'm behind because I didn't do it this weekend because I was grading instead. All right. Hopefully you all have a great weekend. I will talk to you again on Monday. Peace out.